All right, welcome everybody back to another episode of the Big Douglas Show. It is a Friday, so you know we're going inside the command center today. We do that with Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. Sam, how are you? Uh, I'm I'm doing all right. It's been a, a pretty busy last uh, twelve hours or however long it's been since uh, the commanders got blown out on national TV. Usually, people are asking me what the fan vibe is. I'm curious what the vibe was with you guys that cover the team last night. I, I saw the uh, the tweet from John Kime, and I'm not sure I've ever seen him tweet something like that. I don't have the exact tweet pulled up, but it was essentially, you know, I've seen a lot of stinkers in this place. They, you know, they asked the fans to fill up the building. They've done that, and this was quite the game to behold. What was kind of the vibe in the room last night? Humiliation, embarrassment. I mean, this is the fourth year of – a defense. It's the fourth year of a, of a roster build. And I know you have a young quarterback. I know you have a first round pick at corner, but to get humiliated like that by a below average offense on, on national TV against a team that hasn't shown anywhere near that level of capability against anybody else. It's, I, I don't know if you can come up with a word that, that, you know, is strong enough to really describe like how that looked. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, Maybe the worst loss of the Ron Rivera era. The only two other contenders for me are the Cleveland loss in 2022. When you're when you go back to Wentz looking for a spark and it doesn't happen, you get eliminated from playoff contention when you didn't know that was even possible. Or maybe the other one is the Dallas game the day after Christmas in 2021 when John and Duran punch each other on national TV. But to me, that one was was more excusable because it was COVID. You were on a short week. You played on a Tuesday. You were, you know, you were on the road. All the factors that went into that one suggested like, hey, this could be bad. The Cleveland one, particularly going back to Wentz and this, I, I think it's a two man race. It's a two game race for the worst loss of the Rivera era. And man, that it's, you know, it was deflating. On Wednesday, on Opposition Wednesday on this show, I was talking to the editor in chief from the Bears blog. And this current defense they have is closer to being the worst in history than they are to being like the 30th first ranked defense in the league right now. And as much as we'll give a hard time to the defense and we'll talk about that coming up and they deserve it. I mean, the offense had put up three points at halftime again. Like, I mean, it's still one of these deals where they're not, they're not moving the ball or it's, or it's crazy penalties at, at all the wrong times. Like what, what is it that we're, that we're doing right now on, on offense and, and why isn't it clicking? It's a good question. I mean, I think a part of it could be play calling. I mean, they called, I, I don't even know the number, but it, an obscene number of, of pass plays in a row. And you have a quarterback in Sam Howell who takes a lot of sacks. And this Bears defense, I, I think that every, all the film, all the data suggested the Bears were not a good team, maybe even the worst team in the league coming into this game. And, and I haven't changed my mind about that. I still think that's a pretty bad team, but obviously Washington is worse, you know, like substantially worse um, after we watched that game. And I think the offense is a big part of that. Ron Rivera said today on, on Friday, you know, during his press conference that uh, he is a little concerned about the offensive line, but at the same time, Sam Howell holds the ball and he's got to get it out. And I just think that's a recipe for disaster um, when you have a line that you didn't invest in that you thought would be greater than some of its parts. And you have a guy that isn't getting the ball out quickly and, those things are going to derail drives. That's just how it is. Um, let, let me tell you this real quick. It, the, here's the number from Nathan Jenke of PFF. The Washington Commanders dropped back to pass 55 straight times without a Zion run tonight from 849 in the second quarter until the end of the game. That is the most for a team in a game that PFF has data for back to 2006. And he's a guy with six games under his belt. Like, I, I don't – is I think EB forgets that that's not Patrick Mahomes back there. And it's, and it's not um, – it's not an offense that's built to drop back pass. I mean, I know they do it successfully sometimes, but that's offense that needs to succeed um, in certain situations. And if you think about the games that this team has played, other than the Philly game, the Arizona game, they really have never been, you know, kept it closed throughout the whole game, played complimentary football and kind of stayed in what they want to do. Eric Bieniemy, you know, to, you know, sometimes to his detriment, but at the other, at the same time, sometimes I think to his credit, he's leaned into the aggressive approach and said, "Okay, we need to throw the ball to get back into this game." And I think that he's as a, as a you know a first time lead solo play caller is like trying to learn that. But when you have him trying to learn that and the line trying to gel together and Sam Howell being a first time quarterback, you know all those things 
it's a recipe for disaster. It's, it's how you get three points against a wet paper towel defense at halftime. Yeah, it, it's odd too. And, and I really kind of thought that when EB got here, maybe he would change a little bit of what the Kansas City West Coast was, just as just like on how they leaned on Travis Kelsey. I heard a lot of people saying, oh, this is going to be a great year for Logan Thomas with this offense. And I got like, yeah, okay, I get that. But I would hope that they would lean on the trio of receivers that they have, which is really where this offense shines is where our best players are. Jahan Dodson and Terry McLaurin had an 18% target share yesterday combined the two of them. Like you just can't, that's not the way we're set up to win football games. And as good as EB's been, and I think he's been pretty good and he's made more adjustments than I think we've seen anybody do here in a long time. Like those are things I really just kind of expected. And I'm no football genius. Like, what do you see? Yeah, I, I do think that maybe they could have a higher target share, but Sam Howell, for whatever reason, you know, sometimes doesn't get through his read or doesn't throw the ball. You know, I think back to the early part of that um, Buffalo game, or maybe it was the Philly game where he had an RP, you know, the I think it was the Buffalo game where he had that that two play, you know, they, they were driving that he had, he took two sacks. One of them, you know, he just didn't pull the trigger um, on, a, on a quick throw that he had to hit and he, tucks the ball. The second one was an RPO that you got to know, get the ball out of your hand. Um, and he doesn't throw it for some reason and, and, and holds the ball again. So I do think that, you know, maybe they're scheming up more targets for those guys um, than, uh, than, than they're getting, but you know, nothing to the effect of like early in the Philly game when they were designing those touches for Terry, you know, getting it to him on the screen, getting it to him on jets, you know, like things like that. They're not doing that as consistently as I expected them to either. Um, you know, you're, you're getting a lot of touches for Brian Robinson and, and Logan Thomas and, and some other guys that you think, Oh, those are really good complimentary pieces, but those are not the engines of this offense. Those are not our trio of receivers like you pointed out. So to me, it's trying to figure out the right allocation of resources and the right play calls and the balance. And sometimes that's looked great, but more often than not, it's looked like a real work in progress. If my math is right, and I didn't tack them down on paper, but I think six screens in the last two games. Like, I don't, that makes no sense to me. And when they run the screens five or six a game, generally they're successful. I'm confused again about what the offense is supposed to be. I thought we'd see a ton of motion and a ton of screens. The motion I, I think is we're seeing, maybe, well, I, we're seeing some of the motion, but definitely not as much as they use in Kansas city. I think personally, and, and EB hasn't said this, but I think it's because they're trying, they're trying not to put too much on Sam's plate because obviously for the motion, he's going to have to di diagnose two different pictures pre-snap. And if defense is, you know, or disguising. I think that that adds a lot to his plate mentally. And a very fair counterpoint would be, you know, what adds a lot to his plate mentally? Dropping him back 55 straight times. Um, <laughs> but if you're, if you're trying to say, you know, we're trying to load up Sam's play as much as we can, but we can't put it all the way there. I think reducing motion helps, uh, but you're going to give up, you know, a certain level of unpredictability pre-snap and post-snap in that case. Um, but yeah, I mean, to your point, like, what it, it's very clear that the buttons they're pushing, even if they're well-intentioned, even if they're well thought out, it's not working. And so you need to do something different right now. Let's move to the defensive side of the ball. Cause, cause I think that fairly wraps up what the offense is. I mean, I, I think we expected a little bit of growing pains there just with all the things that are new, but when we talk to the defense and I hear the defensive coordinator speak, it's like, you know, we're off to a slow start again and we've got to start faster I've had this podcast for four years now. You've been coming on for four years now. And we have been trying to figure out for four years why we've got slow starts on, on the defense or the football team as a whole. Now, in years past, I can get some of the excuses. There is one new starter on defense. Don't tell me about age. They've been playing together in the same scheme, most of them for four, all four years now. Slow start should not be an excuse on the defense. Slow start shouldn't be an excuse for this team, period. And oh, yeah. If you, if you, I was in the locker room last night and I asked Cam Curl and I asked Kendall Fuller and I asked Benjamin St. Juice, why are the slow starts happening? Like what, like what is going on? Montez Sweat said we came out flat at some point. Which is, is ridiculous, which is ridiculous. Which, right. I mean, it, it's, a you know, one of the worst teams in the NFL at home on a Thursday night, you're sold out crowd again. Like this is the chance to show that, that you're a, you know, you're a legitimate team. You are who you say you are. 
that you have everything to play for. And to come out flat is it, it's incomprehensible. And I could say, like, I, you know, I think when we've talked about this before, I've I've said this or that, and I've been wrong, apparently, because there's no reason, there's no excuse for coming out flat. And and Ron Rivera is betting by saying he's not going to make any defensive staff changes that this group, Jack Del Rio, will get them to rebound as they did in 2020, as they did in 2022. And he's saying we have 12 games left to play. These are the guys we're riding with. And he knows his job's on the line. He knows the pressure and the heat are going to be turned up because of this game. And he's saying, I'm riding with my guys. And that's a choice that he can make. And I do think there is a worthwhile discussion to have about, okay, if they fire Jack Del Rio, who's going to call the plays? There's not an experienced play caller on that staff. Um, you know, and and a couple of the guys. Well, there, there's one. There's one. I mean, what does what is it that Ron Rivera is currently doing right now? I mean, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, <laughs> I don't see him as a legitimate option. Um, I mean, yeah, he he could do it, but I just don't think at this point um, that that would be uh, a positive move for them. Well, and it's not Ron's in Ron's nature, right? Like he's not firing Jack midseason, right? Like somebody would have to tell him. I mean, he fired Eric Washington in Carolina in, in 2018 or 2019. He took over defensive yeah. play calling. Okay. But I just think that he's a different coach now than he was then. Uh, and so, and I don't think you're trusting Steve Russ or Brent Wieselmeyer or Jeff Scanina or any of those defensive coaches to step in and be the play caller um, as, as a first-time guy. So, and, and and frankly, like I don't think that's a crazy decision. I mean, Jack has track record of, of turning around slow starts for whatever reason. I mean, this this started as a discussion about why do they start slow. And it's clear that no one has any reason, no one has any inkling as to why. Because if they if they knew, they would do it. And in years past, you had excuses. You know, oh, William Jackson's playing terrible. We need to bench him. Landon Collins isn't a safety. We need to move him to linebacker. You have no excuses. You, you, you know, you tweaked the coverage last year. And now you're playing more match zone. You have, as you said, only one rookie starter, like, there is no reason, zero reason um, to do it. But I also don't know if there are any better alternatives in terms of who can make these decisions, who's going to fire these guys up. So you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, in my opinion. And there's no good options. You got to bet that Jack Delrio is going to find his way out of it. And that's you You cannot feel great about that. Not particularly. I know the fan base is, and you know they want heads to roll today. Uh, I tweeted out earlier, to me, the biggest conundrum since the draft was that they have three boundary corners. They continue trying to force St. Juice inside. We've talked about this before. I'm sure you know how I feel. I don't think he's well-suited to play inside. I think he's much better on the boundary. And every time they're forced to kick him out to the boundary, like when William Jackson went out a couple years ago, he plays much better there. And, and the defense looks much better there. It feels like they also, when drafting a first-round boundary corner, then said, well, he's going to play nickel, so they drafted Quan Martin, or they drafted Quan Martin as an insurance in case Cam Curl didn't get resigned. Then when asked, you know, he's on the bottom of the depth chart. It's been odd the way they've worked the secondary. Yeah, I mean, it almost looks as though they either don't have a plan or the plan that they've had is um, to just add pieces, and, and those pieces are, are not, you know – um, cohering in the way that they expected. I mean, one of my colleagues, Tramel Rags, went into the Bears locker room last night and was asking the offensive players, why did you have so much success against Washington? And the offensive lineman, Tevin Jenkins, really broke it down for him. And I thought it was really interesting. And I would recommend that people go check out what he said um, in our stories in the Washington Post. But um, the, the, basically the cliff notes was that he said that last year, or you know, actually, let me zoom out here. Last year in Chicago, when they limited the Bears seven points and Benjamin St. Juice had the game-winning breakup, I talked to Benjamin about why were they successful, basically defending Justin as a passer. And obviously you got out of the pocket and did this thing. And he said that they saw Justin Fields couldn't get past his first read. If you could jam his first read, he would pat the ball, hold it, and pressure could get to him. And that was very successful. Um, this year, I think that Justin Fields – he might not have grown a lot. I know that the national uh, scrutiny on him was, was really intense early in the year, but he clearly has progressed mentally because Tevin Jenkins said when Washington showed weak boxes, when they showed weak rotations with safeties, Justin Fields was able to exploit that and take advantage of the space that they were seeing. Um, and that allowed, you know, that opened up a bunch of huge plays. They had nine explosive plays. Four of them, I think were, were for, or five of them were for 32 yards or more. 
he said that basically when safeties were rotating, they either looked lazy or they were not aware of how deep they needed to get. They were missing landmarks. And so when you open up a window of space, Justin Fields was able to capitalize on that, which maybe he wasn't able to last year. So I don't know if that is a game planning problem. I don't know if that is a uh, a personnel, you know, Derek Forrest or Percy Butler didn't rotate far enough, Whether in, and to use Tevin Jenkins' words, lazy or unaware, but clearly is an indictment on the preparation and execution of this defense, and it's a massive problem. Yeah, I think I, I forget who the quote was, but it basically was like, yeah, when Jack went to man coverage, then we'd run the ball up the middle. And when he dropped into zone, then we'd, we'd hit the zone. Have you seen the tweet from Evan Silva today? I have not. On, on the past distributions? Look it up real quick while I talk to you. It's, it's insane. It all goes to DJ Moore. He's the only receiver that caught a pass yesterday. They were all... To the boundary on on hitch and goes it was an amazing thing to see him he threw the ball a couple times to the tight end but literally he's the only receiver that caught a pass last night and essentially on the same route every time yeah i'm not seeing this now but i mean to, to your point like the, justin fields had 282 passing yards and they went to, to three pass catchers total and so i think like when when the bears don't have a lot of skill talent and chase claypool is out because you know he's talking trash about coaches like it's you didn't have to game plan to stop that many guys and and ron rivera should know better than anyone what dj Moore is capable of having drafted him in the first round in, in 2018 in carolina like it's <laughs> i mean look like after a lot of games i think that um Fans, because they're passionate like and i respect it can overreact that's part of being a fan it's part of being a fanatic but I, I really think that that it's argue it's arguable that you can't overreact today because it just there were so many things that suggested Washington should come out and dominate this game. Washington should come out and and really control from the from the get go um, a Thursday night game at home in Week Five with everything going their way and to play how they did was humiliating. They've got two former NFL linebackers on the staff. They still haven't figured out linebacker yet. It was maybe not a glaring weakness in the first couple games, but I thought it really showed last night with Barton. Why is it that Khalid Hudson can't find his way onto the field? I think we've been talking about him for three or four years now. But I like him as a better option. I don't what what is it about Barton that keeps him in the game? I mean, Barton's a bigger body than than Hudson, but I I mean I don't know if if swapping out Barton for Hudson fixes fixes your Probably problem. Not. I, I think it, I think it just goes a lot deeper than that. Like I think really like not being able to get home with four pass rushers, um, not be able to get and then exposing yourself. Who's fault, who's fault is that? I, I mean, um, I haven't I haven't been able to go back and watch you know the the film. Not to not to sound like a coach, but I mean, p- pass rush lane discipline was obviously a, a problem last week. Um, I, I thought you know. Mostly when we talk about pass rush discipline, we're talking about Chase Young most of the time. But I thought he actually played really well just watching the game live. Like he generated a lot of pressure. He was in the backfield, and and I thought the other guys were were the ones who who struggled yesterday, which which was a change. So to me, like I don't know um, why they weren't able to get home with four. And I think Justin Fields' athleticism certainly plays a part in that. But they they generated more pressure against Fields against uh, uh, Hurts, excuse me, against yeah. a better offensive line. I mean, what what was going on? I mean, that's a that's a slow start thing. It's it's incomprehensible that this line has not been able to play up um, to their capability. So, I just think I just think there's a lot going on there. And uh, it, to me, I, I really do think though that it's it's a defensive secondary breakdown, and it's an inability by the front to get pressure. And I know that's a pretty basic football thing, but I mean, it's. Um, it just it just feels like that's the existential question right now is what what is going on with those two units. I had Chris Long on the podcast yesterday. If you haven't seen it, it was a good episode. I asked him about Chase Young and Josh Allen because it feels like when Chase comes back and he's been explosive, you can see it. I mean, it, you can see it on the on the on the TV. But it feels like John Allen takes a step back. Has anybody asked them? Do they? Does anybody know? Like, do they not? Do they not see the field the same way? Do they not vibe off each other the same way? Maybe, maybe I'm off. Maybe you don't see it that way. But this doesn't feel like the same John Allen. And maybe it's just odd timing with Chase coming back. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought John has played 
um, well. He thought he played well early in the year. And But you're right. I mean, the way that I've seen this line is kind of like two of them go off and, and two of them are, are quieter that day. And that's kind of how it's been, you know, since they've um, – since they've been here, they've obviously not lived up to expectations at, at any point other than arguably the second half of 2020. And even then it was against some, some bad quarterbacks and some bad offenses. But I've always thought, you know, it's, it's the two of them or it's it's kind of the two and two model. But John and, and Chase, I right now, my gut reaction is that's more circumstance than than, you know, real no, like signal there. Um, but I, I think it's possible that, that those two don't feel see the feel the same way. It's. It's certainly whatever it is, it's not working. Yes, right. There's no doubt about that because they should be wrecking, they should be wrecking some of these lines. That, that line was so terrible. I I dare you to name three people on that offensive line from last night for the Bears. Kevin Jenkins. Like that, that was the problem. Yeah. And Jenkins, you know, just came back. Dar- Darnell Wright. Yeah. No, and it's I mean it's it's not a name group to your point. Yeah. Um, but but that whole offense is not a name group. And Justin Fields. Justin Fields is on his way out in Chicago. Like they're going to have to blow that up. I think that if they had lost last night, the Bears could have made wholesale changes, you know. And and I and I really, I really struggle to see a path where the Bears like become a juggernaut for the rest of this year or really turn this into a landing, you know, a, a, a jumping off point. And you know, the the NFL is has unparalleled parity, and on any given Sunday is very true. But the Bears are not a good football team. Um, they're not. And uh, they're not. And the defense was missing a ton of parts. Yeah, I know. Yeah, as a, I know as a reporter, you hate to do this. Let's let me let's wrap up like this though. Let me get you put you like crystal ball type deal going on. Do you think that they already have a GM that's watching what's going on that will come in? And if not, how long do you think before that happens? Assuming that wholesale changes are coming after the season. I've seen this chatter about, you know, EB is the coach in waiting, the shadow coach. And um, I don't, I don't buy into that, but I do think they'll and, get a GM. Having a GM in waiting, I, I, to me, like that's a little tinfoil hatty. Um, it's a little okay. conspiracy theorist. Um, I don't think they have someone in place like that because not only would it be in bad faith, I think that like Josh Harris's group is learning the NFL. And if you're learning the NFL at the end of this, at the end of this year, assuming you make changes, you're going to want to bring in the best person. And I don't think that with all the other work they've had to do with getting FedEx up to speed, um, you know, doing game day experience things. I think they've been occupied with other things because they're going to want to have the best GM search, the best head coaching search at the end of this year. And so you're going to need time to get familiar with who are the best candidates. How are we going to find them? How are we, you know, how are we going to interview them? And so like the idea that they've already picked someone is just, I don't think based in reality. And I think it, it's not how Josh Harris operates any of his other teams. And so to me, like that idea has, has no credence. And so then what do they do? Let's say if they lose three out of the next four, let's just say, and they're getting up to the trade deadline and you've got pieces that other teams may want. And you're obviously not winning. Like who makes those decisions, who makes those decisions to pull the cord and try something different. Like not Ron, I mean, Ron, Ron is the final decision maker still, you know, I mean, maybe I mean, he's not going to trade off parts while he still needs to win games. Right. I mean, I don't, I, I'm right. not where this thing comes into play. Right. It's kind of odd. I, I think that Josh Harris or, or Josh Harris's lieutenants in his ownership group, or whether they're, you know, with Harris Blitzer, like maybe at some point, like someone steps in and issues a directive, like you need to trade these parts because the guy we're going to bring in to replace you is going to need an extra pick next year or, or whatever. Um, or he's going to need a guy on a, on a younger rookie contract while we, while we should get rid of chase because he's on an expiring deal and we don't plan to resign him. Like, yeah, those things could happen. But I mean, if Ron Rivera were doing his job like that today, like um, I think that's a really difficult position to put a head coach in. Um, so I don't think it's happened yet. I mean, if they lose three of the next four, Maybe they fire Ron and put it, but again, I mean, here's the thing. Like I get that it would be bad, but like, okay, they fire Ron. Like who are you promoting to replace him? Because if you promote Jack, then it's like rewarding the guy whose unit is underperforming. But if you promote EB, then, I mean, that's a two, that's a catch 22 situation where, okay, like he's trying to get a quarterback and a new offense up to speed. Do you think that adding head coach responsibilities is going to help that? Like, do you, do you think that that will be a great point? Cause they have, I think the casual fan just thinks, Hey, put EB in there and we'll see what happens. But, Right. Like that's like, a whole new job he's never had before. 
It's a whole new job he's never had before. And he also knows that that would be like his, right, his, maybe his one chance to prove it. And great, so it's like, great point. How are you going to be a head coach trying to prove yourself while also saying, Oh yeah, my, my starting quarterback has fewer than 10 career starts and there's a million things he needs to learn. And I'm probably already working 24 hours a day. And you know, like, and now I need to do more like that. Just to me, it doesn't logistically make sense. I, I know people want heads to roll. I know people want change, but I think you also got to like, look at the realities of the situation and say, maybe there isn't a better situation. It, it's wild. It, it's a weird spot to be. Yeah. The last couple of games have been weird. Like that game, they were down by 10 with 10 minutes left in the game last night. And while it never felt like they were in that, the numbers suggest like it, it was within reach and, and, really the Bills game, right? Like how far down were they in the fourth start of the fourth quarter? They were never in that game. But again, it's really funny games that they've been in recently. They don't play normal games. And like they like you said, play. I mean, if Joey Sly doesn't miss that field goal, I think that they right. still feel optimistic that they can like pull that off. Um, I did too, frankly. But uh, I mean, you know, the NFL is, it's a week to week league, right? And it's dramatic and everyone overreacts to everything. And that's a part of it. Like, but what they're doing is not good enough. And, you know, clearly moral victories are, are not a thing and um, something has to change, but I just don't know if it can be in the coaching management perspective. Like maybe you have to bench Emmanuel Forbes, but then it's like, okay, what are we building towards? That's our first round pick. I mean, it's, I I don't see a lot of easy solutions is, is what I'm trying to say. Right, like naturally you'd want to try Benjamin St. Juice and Forbes maybe outside right like that seems like the future of your cornerback unit but 29 has been the best one you've had for a season and a half and and last we saw could not play the nickel i mean you talk about a guy that looked lost in the nickel for whatever reason was forbes less or uh, fuller the last time he's in there so like they put them in themselves in position where they really have no options on some of these things and yeah. it's odd better chance that chase is here next year on the franchise tag or gone gone I, I don't – I mean, it's possible he's here on the franchise tag, but especially if you're talking about is Montez Sweat going to ball out enough for you to, to pay him? Like, um, I mean, both those things are possible. There's still 12 games left. Chase could could ball out. I, I, I really – I mean, 95 I, million, I think, in cap space next year. You technically could do both. You technically could do both, but I, I would – you know, if, if Josh Harris brings in a new GM, I have a hard time imagining he'd commit that level of resources to, to his front four. Um especially if you're going to need to go look for a quarterback again. Um, the only problem is, is is if Chase is anywhere close to the second round pick that you thought he'd be, tough to let a 24-year-old pass rusher walk out the door, even if you're the new GM, right? Like that's – like who, who's, who are you getting better, I suppose? I, I, that's the one reason why I guess I think maybe the fa franchise tag, just that the new GM can get a better look at him. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's possible. Um, but I, I think right now in a binary situation, like what's likelier, like um, – Unless he unless he strings together games like he played yesterday um, and continues to to get sacks and, and get pressure, um, I I just think you know my gut instinct when you asked that question was I think it's a better chance that he's gone. Yeah. Last one. Uh, if they go down to Atlanta next week and they play Heineke over Ritter, how will will the stadium explode? Will will Twitter will Washington Twitter just go crazy? Um. If they, the get if they get Heineke'd, and by Heineke'd, I mean he keeps Atlanta in the game and then makes this miraculous fourth quarter drive after playing like pretty poorly for the rest of the game and wins the game. Like that, that might be a new contender for, for worst game of, of the Ron Rivera era. But don't lose to the hive next week, please. I, uh, I want to be very clear that I think that they made the right decision um, with moving on from Heineke, not committing to him. And like, well, I, I think Taylor is an awesome guy and he's like the closest that anybody who loves to Monday morning quarterback and sit on the couch and, and drink beer and talk about football. Like he is the closest any, any of those guys will ever get to playing in the NFL. And, and I, and I love talking to that dude. I think he's fun. I mean, like they made the right move moving on from him. And if he comes back and he gets them, then like, Good for Taylor because he, you know, he has like defied all the odds to, to carve out this really, really fun, incredible career in the NFL. Um, but I think Washington's fan base might like melt down. Definitely. T -t -t Full blown meltdown. Hey, listen, our good buddy Matthew Paris is off to Louisiana. I thought maybe you'd like to say something nice on his way out the door. <laughs> 
Matty P, the Bulldog, that's my guy. I mean, um, he and Pete Haley and I have, you know, really close friends. I've, I've now lost both those dudes, um, yeah. which is real, real blow. Um, but I'm, I'm super stoked for for Paris to, you know, go down to New Orleans and, and do a lot of good work on, on a team that uh, is, I think, a real like cultural treasure um, for our country uh, and the Saints. And I think that like I think I'm real jealous he's going to live in New Orleans. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, just a great reporter, a great friend, a guy I can't say <laughs> enough great things about smart. And he's like funny as hell. Um, so I'm going to miss him a lot, but uh, I'm excited to see the work that he's going to do down there. Yeah, me too. Sam, as always, I appreciate you. Thanks, man. Of course. Thanks for having me, Doug.